Schamanism. Hab ich das nicht schon mal vorgelesen? Of all the divination practices in the world to promote healing. By archaeological and anthropological evidence, the practice has existed for some 20,000 to 30,000 years, perhaps since the beginning of the human race. Evidence of shamanism has been found globally in isolated regions of the Americas, Asia, Africa, regions of Europe and Australia. It is most prominent in the tribal cultures. Although differences of the practices are found among the cultures, similarities are found too. The shaman is a person who can enter an ecstatic state of altered consciousness. While in the state of altered consciousness or trance, he communicates with his guardian spirit, who gives him information and or power to heal the sick person. Usually the shaman who enters the trance is said to seek information in other reality. Most believe that they must have a close connection with nature because their guardian spirit usually is that of a plant or animal. Many say the guardian spirit takes the shaman to the other reality where he is given his needed knowledge and power through a hole in the world. The shaman may also seek information to help his people and village. In the various cultures, trances are in induced by singing, dancing, chanting and drumming. Some cultures also used psychedelic drugs to actuate trances. Mm -hmm. Guardian Spirit The belief in guardian or guide spirits originated in tribal cultures. The spirit, usually in an animal form, protects individuals, tribes, clans, or provides some sort of magical shamanic power. The power possessed by the animal is generally believed to represent the collective power of the entire species or genus giving the animal magical abilities to perform extraordinary feats, such as the wolf with the power to fight. These spirits usually appear in animal form, but have the ability to assume human form too. In their animal form, it is believed they can talk to humans. This belief in animal formed spirits is derived from a stronger belief than animals and humans were once related that animal and humans were once related. Beliefs concerning guardian spirits vary among the various tribal cultures. Many tribes believe every male child is born with a guardian spirit to protect him, otherwise he would never reach adulthood. Other tribes believe not every male successfully gets a guardian spirit, those who do not experience weakness and failure in their lives. Most tribes assume that it is less important for girls to acquire guardian spirits because when reaching womanhood they do not become hunters and warriors. Although some tribes do have minor rights for girls to acquire guardian spirits. Totem guardian spirits are known among the native North Americans, especially among the tribes along the northwest coast. These totem spirits can protect an entire tribe or clan with collective power or the individual power of the animal. The totem animal is sacred to that particular tribe. If, for example, a tribe's totem animal is a bear, no member of that tribe is permitted to kill a bear, but the tribe may eat flesh of a bear killed by another tribe. In shamanic culture, the shaman is required to have a guardian spirit. He cannot be a shaman without, without one. The guardian spirit empowers the shaman with its magical powers and serves as the shaman's animal power or his alter ego. Within an altered state of consciousness in which he performs his duties, the shaman assumes the form and power of the guardian spirit. He sees it, converses with it, and uses it to help, his, uh, help him achieve his mission. The guardian is never harmful to the shaman, but escorts him through the underworld or accompanies him on his mystical ascents into the sky. The shaman can contact his guardian spirit regularly. This is called dancing the animal. Although 
one guardian spirit does not remain with the shaman throughout his life, the, the stays of the spirit are temporary and new spirits replace them. Guardian spirits are not the same as spirit helpers, which have minor powers and specialized functions such as curing certain diseases and illnesses. A shaman may use spirit helpers collectively, and guardian spirits are not to be confused with helper spirits. Neither are guardian spirits to be confused with the tonal, a spirit in animal form which symbolizes the person's soul or birth date, nor are they familiars. There are several ways of acquiring guardian spirits seeking a solitary spirit quest or vision quest in the wilderness. Spirits may come in dreams to some persons. Many tribes require the acquisition of a guardian spirit during initi initiation rites into manhood. In some rites, halluci hallucinogenic uh, genic drugs are used. One way of communicating with one's guardian spirit is during ecstatic dancing, when the person enters a trance state and assumes the form of the animal. The Zuni, for example, call this dance calling the beast. From the tribal viewpoint, most Westerners still have guardian spirits, but are not aware of them throughout their lives. This is because of their lost contact with nature, and thus they rob themselves of this source of greater reinforcing power. Hmm. A name for a discarnate entity not necessarily pros possessing superior knowledge, but eager to help you humans in humble ways. Also, these entities may be under the data the direction of one or several superior spirits. Helpers are usually recently deceased friends or relatives and distinct from guardian or guide spirits which have greater experience garn garnered from higher spiritual planes. Okay. Stonehenge. In England, situated above Old Chalky Plain, about 8 miles north of Selis Salisbury in Wiltshire is Stonehenge, one of the most enigmatic megaliths ever known. It may be described as an enigma because the questions of who and how it was constructed and for what purpose has, have never been satisfactorily answered. Presently the monument still amazes and puzzles people. The name Stonehenge means hanging stones and was given to the structure by the Saxons. Medieval writers called it the Giant's Dane. Presently the remains of Stonehenge include a henge and horseshoe of sarsen sandstones and blue stones, some which weigh as much as 26 tons. Some of the sandstones are topped by lintels and are called threelithons. The physical construction of the three stages of Stonehenge is spec speculative based on the archaeological evidence found after many excavations and, as it shall be shown, the time of the construction, the stages are approximate. Stonehenge uh, 1, which consisted of a ditch with two banks, three standing stones, four wooden posts and a ring of 56 holes called Aubrey holes, named after John Aubrey, an English 17th century antiquarian. Within the holes, measuring 2.5 feet to 6 feet in width and 2 to 4 feet deep, was found chalk. They appeared to have been often dug and refilled with cremated human remains. Other Stone Age relics were found in the holes too. The heel stone, 20 feet long, 8 feet high and 7 feet wide, was in place. It was the first standing stone. Stonehenge too was erected during the time of the so-called Beaker people who did not believe in cremation. During this stage of 
double circle of 80 giant bluestones brought from the Presselly Mountains in South Wales was built within the Henge. The entrance was widened and an avenue was created linking Stonehenge to the River Avon about two miles away. The discontinuation of the work of Stonehenge II possibly occurred when the Wessex people, powerful and wealthy craftsmen, took over and drove the Beaker people out. This was when the Blue Stones circle was dismantled. The final stage of construction, or Stonehenge III, included three substages. The dating of three of these may, may be as follows: Stonehenge 3A, circa 2100 to 2000 BC; Stonehenge 3B, circa 2000 to 1550 BC; and Stonehenge 3C, circa 1550 to 1100 BC. In the first substage, Stonehenge was shaped as it uh, presently stands, but also in the first and second substages, most of the activity concerned the dismantling and re erecting of the bluestones. In the first substage, 30 sarsens were placed in a carefully spaced ring around a horseshoe of five sarsen thrillithons in the center. A lone upright sarsen was placed outside of the of the double blue stone cycle. It now lies there but seems to be have been inappro inappropriately named the slaughter stone, for there is no evidence that it played any part in any executions or sacrifices. The main event which occurred in the second substage was the erection of the altar stone, which stands in the middle of the horseshoe. In the third substage, the blue stones were once again re erected. A blue stone horseshoe of 19 stones was built within the Trillithons. The remains still stand. There was a placement of blue stone between the Saracen horseshoe and the Saracen circle. Carvings of bronze axes and daggers, symbols of the sun, were made in the Saracens. Boats of the dead were hammered into the western stones. Stonehenge represents a feat of exceptional engineering by civilized people. One estimate is that the construction of original structure required an overwhelming... Uh, what the hell? 1 million, 1.5 million men days of physical labor, including logistics and planning. Estimated dates of, for the construction of the three stages range from 3500 to 1100 BC. Professor R.J.C. Atkinson in 19... 56 approximated, approximated the dates of the stages as followed. Um, okay. So, from the above estimated dates, the time of the construction of Stonehenge is very uncertain. Professor Atkinson's dates are described as very approximate. This too adds the enigma surrounding the structure. Also, the exceptional engineering feat Stonehenge adds to its enigma. The lintels of the Saracen circle uh, cycle were joined together with such accuracy that it is hardly believable that it was accomplished with a naked eye alone, without instruments. The lintels themselves had to be raised 20 feet before being placed on the uprights to which they were secured by pre-cut tenons and mortise joints. Practical speaking, such craftsmanship did not co coincide with the people living within the area at that time. The inhabitants in Britain around 2000 BC were nihilistic, uncivilized farmers living within small villages village communities, they neither knew how to use metals nor how to read or write. 
The estimations of the number of men that would have been needed to move the 81 sarsen stones makes it seem humanly impossible. Professor Atkinson estimates that with no less than 1,500 men working constantly with only a few days of rest between trips to move the stones from nearby Avebury to Stonehenge would have taken five and a half year. Five and a half years. Professor G. S. Hawkins estimated the quarter of a million to a million and a quarter man days would have been required to build the third stage. The population to supply such a labor force simply did not exist. All this speculation has only heightened the questions as to why and how the structure was built. King James I ordered the first authoritative study of modern times when instructing his surveyor general of work and great architect Inigo Jones to survey the structure to determine how it got there. Jones's first conclusion was that Stonehenge was constructed with such design and beauty that it could not have been built by the Druids as previously thought. The Druids and others of the time were considered barbaric, unskilled people. Jones concluded that Stonehenge had to be constructed by civilized people who were skilled in architectural design and mathematics. The following obvious conclusion was that Stonehenge was built by the Romans, but the speculation of the date of construction of the first stage, stage renders the Roman construction theory erron erroneous. Stonehenge was, or was being, constructed practically 2,000 years before Julius Caesar set foot on British soil. Although the Roman construction of Stonehenge theory is erroneous, this does not invalidate Jones's theory that the structure was built by civilized people. Both the architectural and engineering design of the stru structure give evidence of this. This construction was clearly beyond the skills of barbaric man. Tja. Aber vielleicht waren sie ja gar keine Barbaren. <laughs> Going along with the statement that Stonehenge was built by people with highly skilled architectural and engineering abilities is the theory that the structure served as an astronomical observatory. There has been, there's been much debate over this issue, but there exists evidence to subst substantiate the observatory theory. And unless it can be refuted, on mathematical grounds, such evidence must be accepted. The evidence is based on the exact placement of the stones and is detailed in two books, Megalithic Sites in Britain and Megalithic Lunar Observatories by Alexander Thom of Oxford University. Within these books are the, re the results of surveys which Thom conducted on megaliths ranging from the Orkney Isles, Islands and the outer Heb Hebrid Hebrides to the South Brittany. The conclusions of Thom's work can be listed and summarized under five headings. These headings included results from the many sites surveyed. surveyed. The shape. Except for some exceptions, the megalithic sites were not laid out as stone so cycles uh, at all, but as geometric de designs which appear to be circles. Some circles were flattened on one side, others were elongated, egg-shaped, and others were eclipses, but all were accurately laid out in design. Unit of measurement at all sites, the same unit of measurements was used. This thumb named the megalithic yard. He established its length as 2720 feet or 829 millimeters. Since this unit of measurements was used at every site, Thom also concluded there had to be a central distribution point from which he 
r which the rots came, that the workers in the surrounding areas of the sites had made them there would have been discrep discrepancies. Preference and numbers. The builders seemed to prefer whole, num whole numbers to incommensurables. But incommensurables. All cir circumferences and radii were measurable in whole numbers of the megalithic yard. The figure 5 was preferably used in connection to the Pythagorean triangle. Orientation. From an analysis of all his surveyed sites, Thom found, as did Hawkins at Stonehenge, stones were accurately aligned in too many incidences to be accidental. The alignments directly pointed at sites such as a mountain peak or a notch in a skyline where the sun or moon or a star of a first magnitude will rise or crest at certain moments in its path. The axes of their circles were likewise aligned. Accuracy. Whether Thorm discovered stones aligned, he found they had been set up with precision-like accuracy. The accuracy at Kalanish on the island of Lewis in the outer Hebrides, Hebrid, I don't know, in some circles was within one tenth of one degree. On Avebury, the accuracy approached one in one thousand. From these facts, it would seem safe to judge the megaliths were used as lunar observatories. An astronomical observation concerning Stonehenge was made by William Stukeley, an 18th century antiquarian and archaeologist. Was there were two distinct alignments with the sun and moon over the four burial stones called the four stations and the heel stone. The four stations have their short sides directed toward the midsummer sunrise and their long side directed toward the setting of the moon. Another distinct astronomical phenomena of Stonehenge is that a visitor standing at the center of the structure on Midsummer Day, June 24th, can see the sunrise directly over the heel stone. Even though Inigo Jones disproved the Druids built Stonehenge, Stokely agreed with John Aubrey that the Druids possibly used the structure as a temple or psychic center. Stukeley also believed the Druids to be serpent worshippers and thought both Stonehenge and a Avebury were temples of serpent Draconita. Another possible use was an observati observatory for the Druids developed the own colony or bush barrow calendar. Though there is a good body of evidence that Stonehenge and other monolithic sites were used as lunar observatories, this still does not answer the question as to who built them. It has pretty much been established that Britain did not have the skilled population at the time Stonehenge was constructed. There are assumptions that populations to construct these megalithic sites were imported. A clue which may have prompted such speculations lies in Thorm's assumptions that there was a central distribution from which standard rods were received. The first of many of these assumptions is that these imported people were from Egypt. However, the primary objection of this is the age of the oldest megaliths, approximately 4000 BC, several centuries before the first Egyptian dynasty and over 1,000 years before the first pyra pyramids. However, in spite of this objection, the builders are known to be megalithic people, and the term megalithic culture is not descriptive of one homogeneous culture, but of a complex of cultures. From the studies of an amateur 
etymologist J.P. Cohen, written in his book The Key, some subjective conclusions have been drawn. These conclusions seem to subs substantiate the above facts. A pre-Sumerian civilization was established in the Euphrates Valley in the 5th millennium BC. From this civilization, men sailed to explore all parts of the world. It is suggested, suggested whether by necessity or choice, a group landed in Britain or France and stayed there. They founded the first megalithic culture and they were the ones who built the first passage graves. Eventually, with the passage of time, they reverted back to barbarianism. The above suggested solution seems to fail to meet two conditions set forth by the assumptions of Inigo Jones and Thom concerning the builders of Stonehenge. Namely, it is doubtful that such early explorers explorer, explorers, would have the architectural and engineering skills to build Stonehenge as Jones concluded. Second, there is no reference to a central distribution point as Thom suggested, suggested in uh, the builder's head. A more plausible suggestion would seem to be the builders of Stonehenge and possibly the other megaliths as well came from the kingdom of Atlantis before it sunk into the sea. Evidence of this possibility comes from the quotes of Plato in the Critias, a report allegedly from Egyptian archives that mentions men who lived on the sea called the Atlantic. Their kings ruled many islands situated there and later extended their rule over those within the pillars of Hercules up to Egypt and Thyrenia. Although there is a question of the actual existence of Atlantis, as discussed in the description of the kingdom, this suggest suggestion seems plausible. Almost everyone agrees Plato was not merely telling a story, but was des describing actual known facts in his description of Atlantis. And in the Crit Critias, where he says the capital of these ruling kings was Atlantis. In his description of Atlantis, Plato described it as a perfect, perfectly designed, symmetrical city. If the builders of Stonehenge had migrated from Atlantis, then they would have possessed the technical skills to construct the megaliths, and it is described as it is described. If they came directly from Atlantis, then that city could have been their central distribution point, or if they had migrated to Egypt first, then the distribution point could have been somewhere in Egypt. If the latter is true, then the above theory of early explorers, rah, 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 explorers sailing to Britain or France and stating the first megalithic culture becomes more plausible. Either way, both conditions of the two assumptions exposed by Jones and Thom are met. The objection might be made when one speaks of Atlantis, one enters the area of mythology. This can be replied to as being correct, but there is more mythology surrounding Stonehenge. A major portion of such mythology is found in Arthurian lore and concerns the magician Merlin. According to legend, Merlin supposedly magically transported Stonehenge from Ireland to England. This is told by Geoffrey of Manmouth in his Histories of the Kings of Britain, written in the 12th century. The British King Ambrosius, who was the reputed brother of Uther Pendragon and uncle of Arthur, wanted a burial place and an everlasting memorial for the Britons who were treacherous, treacherously killed at a meeting on Salisbury Plain to which the Saxon Hengist had invited them. 
At the king's wish, Merlin sent for the giant's ring, which was then situated on Mount Killer Killarius in Ireland. Further mythology concerns the heel stone was first named by Aubrey. He said it resembled an indentation of a heel. The legend surrounding this stone, also called the Friar's Heel, says a friar and the devil were fighting. At the moment of sunrise, the devil was forced to run away and the stone struck the friar on the heel. As a political site, Stonehenge is alleged to be the burial place of the pagan queen Boadicea, who fought the Romans, a gallows for British soldiers in honor of the god Woden, and a memorial for slain men fighting against the Saxons. A recent theory concerning the third stage of Stonehenge was that its construction was to celebrate the annual marrying of the gods. When writing about Stonehenge, one feels like a mathematician who divides the number one by the number three. There was always a remainder left which could reach into infinity if the division procedure were extended long enough. Such a comparison is applicable to Stonehenge because of its enigmatic characteristics. Answers and speculations that are given to questions invariably, invariably lead to other questions and speculations. This is why Stonehenge remains one of the great mysteries of humankind, always challenging the mind to wonder about its mysterious and mystical path. Okay. Wow, wow, wow. Also, das ist ja auch eine ganz schöne Aufgabe hier mit dem Vorlesen hier. Megaliths. Megaliths are large stone structures or groups of standing stones which are located at sites in various parts of the world and believed to have religious significance. The term megalith means great stone, which is derived from the Greek words Megas, great, and lithos, stone. However, the general meaning of megaliths includes any structure composed of large stone, which includes tombs and circular standing structures. Such, such structures have been found in Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, and North and South America. Their origins and purposes have tantalized experts and ordinary people for centuries. There is a general consensus that many were built in the Neolithic and Early Bronze Age. Those found in India date from the first centuries of the Christian era. The megaliths on Easter Island in the South Pacific probably are contemporary with the medieval period of Europe. The general speculation as to their purposes is that megaliths were used for religious activities, burial sites, burial sites, astronomical observa observatories for the sun and other celestial bodies. Some megaliths are said to possess supernatural or electromagnetic forces. Megaliths are classed in two general categories, dolmens and menhirs. Dolmens, also called chamber tombs, usually contain one or two chambers or rooms in which the dead were buried. Some dolmens also contain long stone chambers or halls which connect different rooms. These long chambers also are referred to as long tombs and passage graves. Long tombs are prevalent in Wales, Scotland and England, while passage graves are mostly found in Ireland and western parts of Britain. Tombs which are covered with earth to form mounds are called tumuli, tumulus. 
There is evidence that dolmens were used for other purposes besides burying the dead because remains of bodies have not been found in all of them. Therefore, some dolmens may have served only as temples for the dead. However, there are signs that ritual sacrifices and even cannibalism occ occurred within those dolmens. It is thought prehistoric man believed the spirit spirit resided resided in the head. Therefore, breaking open the head might have been an attempt to free the spirit. If some dolmens served as temples, then most likely religious activities and gatherings occurred within them too. Menhirs are large standing stones or groups of standing stones arranged in circles or cromlex and hinges. A bank or ditch that surrounds the circular hinges which distinguishes them. There is always one or more entrance to them. Standing stones, especially those containing holes, were thought to have supernatural or magical powers to heal or hurt. Ill people would crawl through the holes hoping to restore their health. Sick children were passed through the holes hoping the magic of the stone would heal them. Women desiring to become pregnant or seeking other wishes would hug the stones and even crawl through their holes at times. The stone's reputation for having supernatural forces have over the centuries made them desired gathering places for witches. During the trial of the Aberdeen witches of Scotland in 1596, the accused confessed to dancing around a grey stone at the foot of Craig Leak Cleach Hill. The Lancaster witches were said to have met at the Horror Stones in Britain's Pendle Forest during the 17th century. Another meeting site was the Bambury Stone of Breeden Hill. Fairies were said to reside in some of the stones and some people left them gifts to gain their favor. Some men here have devil and other other legends associated with them. Among these are the roll ride stones of the Cots Cotswolds in England, where witches met until the middle of the 20th century. Some men here are believed to have earth energy emanating from them. Photographs have shown this energy as light radiating from the stones. Some researchers believe the stones stones as creators imbued this energy within them for sacred and psychic purposes. Some psychics do not want to be around the men here at night because of their abnormal powers. Researchers have reported when placing their hands on the stones, they received electric shocks strong enough to knock them down. The greatest and oldest of all me megaliths still exists on Karnak, in the con countryside of Brittany. Of the estimated original uh, 11,000, only 3,000 still stand arranged in avenues, dolmens, mounts and cromlechs. One dolmen covered with a tumulus has been dated back to 4700 BC. Okay. Roll right stones. A group of prehistoric of standing stones or megaliths located in the Cotswolds in England. They are thought to be connected to pagan rituals and in popular legend with a witch. They are estimated to be older than Stonehenge and are located between Chipping, Norton and Long Compton. They stand on a high, windy ridge overlooking the latter. This area has a long history of witchcraft activities. The legend of the stones is that once an unnamed Danish king and his army came to invade England. At Rollright they met a witch and the king sought her to use her supernatural vision to foretell whether he would conquer England. 
The witch told him if he took seven strides to the top of the ridge and could see the village of Long Compton below, he would become king of England. The king followed the witch's instructions and took seven steps to the top of the ridge. When reaching his destination, he found his view blocked by a barrow. Suddenly, the witch cried, Sing down, man, and rise up stone. King of England, thou shalt be known. Suddenly, the king and all of his men turned to stone. The king became the solitary king stone. His men formed a crumlek, or cycle, nearby and are called the king's men. The witch intended to change herself into an elder tree, but before doing so, she went back to four of the king's knights who had lingered behind. They had been whispering and plotting the king. She also turned them into stone, and today they are called the whispering knights. Originally, there were 11 kings' men, but over time, some have been broken. The Kambalek measured 100 feet across. The stones are believed to be of the Bronze Age. The Whispering Knights are thought to form some sort of burial ground. According to another legend, at midnight, the stones turn into men again. They join hands and dance around. Anyone unfortunate enough to see them goes insane or dies. Later in the 18th century, village maidens or Midsummer's Eve would go out by the Whispering Knights, hoping to hear whispers of their future and fate. Until the middle of the 20th century, witches held meeting at Sabbaths at the Rolled Ride Stones. However, in 1945, a sacrificial killing was supposed to have occurred there. Soon the local people became suspicious of the meetings being held there, and finally in 1949, the witches were forced to meet elsewhere. An interesting note is that a person practicing psychom psychometry investigated the rural red stones and claimed to have found important information of ancient pagan rituals once practiced there. Psychometry. The ability or faculty to perceive the characters, surroundings and events connected with a person by holding an object belonging to that person in one's hands. Mrs. Hester Drowden, a famous medium, defined psychometry as a psychic power possessed by a certain individual which en enables them to divine the history of or events connected with a material object with which they come into close contact. It is general, genu generally speculated it is generally speculated the faculty existed in ancient times, but it was first named and discussed in the modern age by J. Rhodes Buchanan, an American scientist in 1842. The term is derived from the Greek words psychic, soul, and metron, measure, and signifies soul measuring or measurement of the human soul. Oh man, Buchanan's theory was based on the belief that every thought, action and event that has ever occurred since the beginning of time has left an impression on either. either. Mm. This impression will never be erased during what is considered as time. This is why many closely related the ability of psychometry to the Akashic records. Buchanan also thought the impressions were not only left on ether, but on more palpable objects, such as trees or stones as well. Many people, especially occultists, also believe that psychometry is connected to the belief of animism. They believe all objects possess an inner or psychological life which enable the objects to receive from and transmit impressions to other objects. In this way, the impressions 
of an individual can be transmitted to an object with uh, which the person has in his possession and the object can later transmit the same impressions to another individual holding the identical object in his hand. The object is therefore analogous to a television receiver and transmitter in that it receives and transmits impressions. The late Arnold Crowther, witch and oc occultist, describes psychometry in The Secrets of Ancient Witchcraft with the Witch's Tarot, which he co-authored with his wife Patricia. He, to he too held to the belief of animism, or that inanimate objects have memories of their own. This was especially true of stones, he thought. But Crowther also equally believed that psychometry was connected with the auras giving off by all objects. He believed the success of ancient witches in healing people of their villages was due to their ability to translate these auras through touch. He tested his theory on a modern psychometrist and found evidence that it was probably true. This, uh, the connection between psychometry and auras is based on the theory that the human mind radiates an aura in all directions and around the entire body which impresses everything within its orbit. All objects, no matter how solid they appear, are po porous, containing small or even minute holes. These minute uh, crevices in the object's surface collect minute, minute, I don't know, uh, fragments of the mental aura of the person possessing the object. Since the brain generates the aura, then something worn near the head would transmit better vibrations. Crowther further describes psychometri psychometry as akin to the mind's eye, the etheric eye, or the soul's eye, Occultists have called it by all these names. It seems the mental facu faculty which receives the impressions of visions regis regis registers them. Oh. It seems the mental faculty which receives the impressions of visions registers them in the same cerebral center where dreams are registered. The center is the area where the pineal gland is located in the middle of the brain, at the level of the base of the nose. Some medical doctors have referred to this gland as the relic of the third eye which man had in the early evolutionary stages. This is why some have called psychometry controlled daydreaming. Ay, ay, ay. Crowther believed psychometry would ha could help in many areas of life. The recovery from knowledge of the past was important to him. He thought stones were important in such endeavors and noted a psychometrist friend who psychometrized the stone circle called the Rollright Stones in Oxfordshire. The man gained valuable information concerning ancient religious and magical rites once performed there. Portions of such knowledge Crowther used in the book previously mentioned. Crowther did not believe psycho psychometry is a special ability or gift. He held this idea from spiritualists' mediums. He also differed with Dr. Buchanan, previously mentioned, who stated in his book A Manual of Psychometry that women are better adept at the practice than men. Crowther knew many male psychometrists. He thought everyone has the ability and can learn to use it if they have the patience and the will to do so. Psychometry is presently practiced by occultists and witches. It is done with crystals and other stones. The person with uh, with eyes shut takes a stone in her or his hand, carefully feeling it, 
the individual tries to visualize its shape, texture and color. Along with these physical features, the person tries to reach an intuitive connection with the stone through which feelings and impressions are received from the stones. When done with a groups, uh, these inspirations may be shared with others. Okay. Ich kann kaum noch richtig sprechen hier. Ooh. Akashic Records. A theosophical term referring to a universal filtering system which records every occurring thought, word and action. The records are impressed on a subtle substance called Akasha. Sonny Ferris Ether. In Hindu mysticism, this Akasha is thought to be the primary principle of nature from which the other four natural principles, fire, air, earth and water, are created. These five principles also represent the five senses of the human being. Oh my god, I come from the some indicate the Akashic records are similar to a cosmic or collective consciousness. The records have been referred to by different names including the cosmic mind, the universal mind, the collective unconscious or the collective subconscious. Others think the Akashic records make clairvoyance and psychic perception possible. It is believed by some that the events recorded upon that Akasha can be assert ascertained or read in certain states of consciousness. Such states of consciousness can be induced by certain stages of sleep, weakness, illness, drugs and meditation. So not only mystics but ordinary people can and do perceive the Akashic records. Some mystic claim to be able to reanimate their contents like they were turning on a celestial television set. Yogis also believe that these records can be perceived in certain psychic states. Certain persons in subconscious states do read the Akashic records. An explanation for this phenomena is that the Akashic records are the macrocosm of the individual subconscious mind. Both function similar similarly they possess thoughts which are never forgotten. The collective subconscious gathers all thoughts from each subconscious mind, which can be read by other subconscious minds. An example of one who many claimed successfully read the Akashic records is the late American mystic Edgar Case. Case did his readings in a sleep state or trance. His, methods, his method was described by Dr. Wesley H. Ketchum, who for several years used case as an adjunct for his medical practice. Case's subconscious is in direct communication with all other subconscious minds and is capable of inter interpreting through his objective mind and imparting impressions received to other objective minds, gathering in this way all knowledge possessed by endless millions of other subconscious minds. Apparently, G Case was inter interpreting the collective subconscious mind long before the psychiatrist C.J. Uh, Jung postulated his concept of the collective unconscious. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I come from hundreds and thousands. To... <sighs> Clairvoyance is the psychic ability or power to see objects and visions or to gain information regardless of its distance. The visions may also be in the future and sometimes in the past. Clairvoyance is an umbrella term which often refers to telepathy, spiritualism, psychic research, second sight, prophetic visions and dreams. Clairaudience, which is similar to clairvoyance, is the 
psychic ability to hear things from afar. Both phenomena can occur in normal state of consciousness, but also can be induced by drugs, fa fasting, illness, hyper... Uh, hyperesthesia and scrying. Oh boy. Scrying is the ancient act of divination for the purpose of clairvoyance. It is usually achieved by concentrating on or staring at an object having a shiny surface until a vision appears. Magicians and witches have practiced scrying throughout the ages. The typical stereotype of a person scrying is a gypsy fortune teller looking into her crystal ball. Scrying comes from the English word descry, which means to make out dimly or to reveal. There have been and are many purposes for the activity to see into the future, to find lost objects or persons and track criminals, among others. In the Middle Ages, a wise woman or a wise man, perhaps also called a witch, with a natural gift of second sight, was called upon for scrying purposes. Although the object used for scrying usually has a shiny surface, innumerable objects have been used for the practice over the centuries. The Egyptians used ink, blood and other dark liquids. The Romans used shiny objects and stones. Water has been used for gazing into. Mirrors are often used. There is an example of the interior of a cauldron being painted black, then filled with water at night. A silver coin was dropped into the water, so to reflect moonlight. Such means have been employed to see visions and read mystical signs. Many witches scry in a magic circle to prevent outside influences from distorting their visions. Also, this is why most scrying is done at night in order to receive better psychic vibrations. As a general rule, most diviners work at night in order to avoid the excessive psychic vibrations that are generated in the day due to the confusion of everyday living. The method methods of scrying differ, but after a period of concentration on the speculum visions, mental images or impressions appear. Frequently, the visions are symbolic, and the scryer must be trained and skillful in interpreting interpreting their meanings. Divination. In this section, divination and various divinatory forms are examined. Oh, wow. Okay, that muss ich mir nochmal aufschreiben. Divination. Okay, done. We go back. Duality, the Gnostic belief in the separation of good and evil, heaven and earth, carnate and incarnate, many, what, many chaism first expostulated the concept that all material things were, by definition, evil, including everything on earth and every human being. The king of the material realm is Rex Mundi. Associated with the Christian devil, in contrast, heaven, the incarnate realm, is sinless and holy. Man's soul is incarnate, but is trapped in the mortal world of sin. It is man's task to renounce the material world and his own flesh in order to gain heaven. From this belief sprang Catharism, another major Gnostic heresy. At least according to the Pope. A similar concept of duality was later incorporated by the Rosa Crucians. The symbol of duality is a hexagram fashioned from two superimposed triangles, triangles which represents the dual nature of soul and flesh. Runes, a form of divination. The term rune is derived from the Indo-European root ru which means mystery or secret. 
Runes were at first ancient Norse and Teutonic alphabets and symbols that were ascribed with various magical, mystical and divinatory properties. These various alphabetical s signs have been passed down through the centuries and were th thought to possess religious and magical meanings. Personal runes can represent letters, deities, qualities, events and natural forces. Runic symbols have been found carved on rocks dating from the Neolithic and Bronze Ages. Continuing discoveries showed they had been carved by tribes in northern Italy. They were also present, present in Sweden and among the Germanic people. According to myth, the runes were created by the North, Norse god Odin, also Woden or Woten. The one-eyed chief of the gods, also the god of wisdom and war. Odin acquired the forbidden and mystical knowledge of the runes by impaling himself by his own spear to Yggdrasil, the world tree, for nine days and nights. Although runic carvings were found throughout Western Europe, but the greatest concentration was in England, where the alphabet was increased to 33 characters from its original 24. In Scandinavia it was reduced to 16. In Britain the alphabet was called Futhork, after its first letter, letters F-U-T-H-O-R-K. <laughs> the runes coexisted for centuries along with Christian symbols such as the cross. One of the earliest historical references to them is in the 4th century AD, when the Gothic Bishop Ulfilas in division, a uh, division, devising, I don't know. The Gothic alphabet borrowed the U and O from the runic alphabet. In Western Europe, during the Dark Ages, runes were believed to possess potent magical powers. These magical powers, attributed to runes, were believed to be released in the etching of names, phrases, memorial inscriptions and spells upon bones, metal, wood and stone. The, these were inscribed on gravestones to describe the deeds of the departed and to ward off grave robbers. It was thought that uh, words having a runic inscription became more powerful to inflict more pain and death upon the enemy. The powers of runes was thought for various things such as victory in battle, healings, acquisition of physical powers, protection from the evil eye, cursing, love, fertility and other enchantments. Such beliefs and interests in the runes was diminished by the Inquisition. <laughs> yeah. Magicians etched them on magical tools, even sometimes sprinkling blood on them to increase their magical potency. The magicians passed these tools onto their in initiates, initiates, telling the initiates of the power by word of mouth. Runic symbols were inscribed, but never in the light of day, on items such as wands made of hazel, ash, or dew. You, swords, chalices, or stone ta tablets, to obtain whatever the magician desired. Belief in runic power was strong among the German soldiers during World War I. This was because secret chiefs of the Germanen Order, a runic society founded in 1912, signed their names in runic characters. They sold amuletic bronze rune rings to soldiers for protection. A rune mania occurred throughout the country, which included yodeling during yoga-like exercises to release the rune mystical powers and meditating over runes to cure illnesses. Perhaps two runes were destroyed forever by the Nazis. These are the swastika, originally Thor's hammer, the symbol of the Earth Mother and the Sun, and the sign uh, the Sikh 
or S. Rune, the trademark of Heinrich Himmler's Schutzstaffel or the SS. The Norse neo pagans tried to bring back the swastika as a runic symbol without much success. Ja, die Nazis haben diese Runen wahrscheinlich für immer verdorben. Die Nazis haben die eigentlich geklaut aus anderen Kulturen, aber haben sie dann für alle Zeiten, für alle Leute äh, unbrauchbar gemacht. Die sind jetzt einfach ja immer in Verbindung mit, mit bösen Taten, wenn man an sie denkt. Schade eigentlich. Sehr schade. Die Kulturen können da ja nichts für, für die Nazis. Beginning in the 1980s and continuing to the present, it became popular to use rune stones for divinatory, divinatory purposes. They are cast like coins or sticks in one ching what? One ching or laid out in crosses or wheels such as tarot cards. Some modern witches inscribe their magical tools and personal jewelry with runic characters. The magical use of runic in Western practices has been revived in New Age ideas. And activities. Ralph Bloom, a Fulbright scholar and Harvard graduate, has adapted runes for oracular purposes. He details these purposes and activities in his two books, The Book of Runes and Rune Play, which are accompanied by 25 letters stationed on ceramic counters, which can be used for casting in a similar divinatory manner as in I Ching, Wan Ching. Another method of casting runes in Western magic is to write the letters on slips of papers that are given, handed or sent to the victim of the spell. Such a method was brilliantly described in the short story Casting the Runes by M. R. James in More Ghost Stories of an Antiquary, 1911. In the story, one character slips runes into a ticket case of the victim. The case is then dropped where the victim will notice that it is his. He assumes he dropped it and picks it up. Therefore, the runes and their spell are casted onto him. Mm -hmm. Tarot by Evelyn Henry. Oh my god. The tarot, as originally created, stemmed from life as it was experienced during a, during a certain historical period, the Renaissance. Since that time, the distance between the original purpose of the tarot as it was created and what it has evolved into today continues to diverge. During the course of this short article, I will attempt to bridge that span so as to give the reader a comprehensive view of this fascinating card game. Much speculation exists as to the origins of the tarot. Popular myths and rumors abound of their beginnings in ancient Egypt or with the Romanian gypsies. However, actual history shows a somewhat different story. History The earliest record of a deck of cards carrying tarot symbology can be traced back to northern Italy, where for the first few centuries they were used as a parlor diversion called Cartes de Triomphi. According to tarot historians Ronald Decker, Thierry de Poli and Michael Dumet, a wicked pack of cards. The earliest surviving set of tarot cards is the few remaining hand-painted cards created in approximately 1441 for the court of Filippo Maria Visconti, Visconti, Duke of Milan. A hundred years prior to this, packs of 52 playing cards bearing the suit symbols of cups, coins, swords and polo sticks could be found in Islamic countries, from whence 
they migrated into Euro Europe via the British. It was only which, uh, with the addition of the 22 trump cards sometimes after the 18th century that the pack came to resemble what we now recognize as the modern tarot deck. Speculation about the Egyptian origins of the tarot springs almost exclusively from the conclusions and assertions of one person, Antoine Cour de Gébelin, Gébelin, a Protestant pastor born in 1695. Caught up in a period of widespread fervor over the mystery of all things Egyptian, Cour Cour de Gabelin's essay in his work Monde Primitive says that he discovered this mysterious work while visiting a lady acquaintance occupied in playing with the game of tarot. Within a short time, 15 minutes, he pronounced them to be a mysterious book of knowledge of Egyptian origin origins which had survived the ravages of time. Similar conclusions were drawn in another essay by Cour de Gébelin, Pierre Comte, Comte de Mêlée. The belief that the tarot originated with the gypsies sprung from the same fount of speculation based on the mistaken idea that the gypsies originally came from Egypt. Mystery. Despite the lack of hard evidence as to the mystical origin of the tarot, the symbology of the tarot can be traced to the ancient Greeks as well as to the myths and legends of other ancient cultures. From these convergent and divergent points, a school of thought developed that compared the cards to the intricate Judaic system of Kabbalah and the Tree of Life. An more important component of the early development of modern hermetic magical systems. Developing further into the founding of the Order of the Golden Dawn and Freemasonry. Okay. Early Hermetic Tarot scholars, including Papus, MacGregor, Mathers, Eliphas, Levi, Alistair Crowley, and Arthur E. Waite, contributed vastly to the body of mystical knowledge which comprises the basis of modern tarot. Crowley and Waite, being the creators of the two most popular systems, extend today the Thoth and the Rider Waithe deck respectively. While Crowley's Thoth deck developed to incorporate Kabbalistic theory along the lines of the developing OTO, Ordo Templi Orientis and Golden Dawn systems, A.E. Waite's interpretation of the tarot stands today visually as the standard by which all tarot decks are judged. Prior to this, the minor arcana or pip cards of the tarot were illustrated with various geomet geometric arrangements of the four suit symbols, cups, swords, batons, coins. With the aid of artist Pamela Coleman Smith, Wade incorporated scenes symbols and Im imaginary into the pip cards, which, although continuing to be of hermetic, cabalistic interpretation, assigned a more graphic meaning to the cards, bringing them, bringing them within a more accessible reach to the general public, or at least those with an interest in the occult. In the process, he also changed the suits of but batons, batons, to wands and coins, to pentacles, to realign them with his ideas about their connection to the magical disciplines. Crowley's deck, oriented more toward the hermetic tradition, 
continuing with the geometric suit design of the pips. However, his book of Thoth, written as an explanatory text for the deck, is considered basic required reading by tarot authorities. Evolution The creation of the weight deck began a variable veritable avalanche avalanche of new decks into the marketplace many artists saw the medium as a way to present variations of artistic genre creating decks which were very veritable galleries of miniature artwork the occultists saw it as a way to broaden and further the study of other magical spiritual traditions and began to assert a universal connection between weights, assigned meanings and their own traditions. Thus, today we see decks containing images from many spiritual paths and historical time periods, including Native American, Mythological, Celtic, Arthurian, Pagan, Abori Aboriginal, Renaissance and even combinations de thereof into a single deck. However, despite the variations in presentation, the basic stru structure of the standard or arch archetypal, archetypal tarot deck consists of two groups of cards, known as the Major Arcana and the Minor Arcana. Arcana meaning secret or hidden. Briefly, the major arcana deal with images that represent the broader, universal, often spiritually oriented issues, ideas, beliefs, and experiences of life. The minor arcana deal with the more mundane themes of everyday living. The majors contain 22 cards numbered from 0 to 22. The minors contain 56 cards divided among four suits cups wands swords and pentacles each of the suits have their own overarching associations and the cards within each suit have uh, their own meaning the standard method for reading the cards involves the use of a spread which means the card or cards chosen from the deck are placed in a certain position that has a designated meaning and interpreted from there. The methods of choosing the cards vary widely from reader to reader. Some allow the querent full range, range to shuffle and choose the cards and place them where they please, relying heavily on the random aspect of chaos to reveal the issue at hand. Some never allow anyone to touch their cards and insist on placing the cards in a certain design in specific ways, feeling more comfortable in a highly structured reading environment. Readings can fall anywhere between the two extremes depending on the card reader. Spreads, of which there are hundreds, vary widely as well. The most widely widely used spread, spread is called the Celtic Cross, the origin of which are a topic for another dissertation, consisting of ten positions for the cards which are generally labelled as falling. Significator, central issue, crossing, basis of the issue, recent past, possible outcome, near future, self, environment, hopes and fears, outcome. Readers have come to rely on this spread as an all-encompassing containment of information that provides the querent with answers to most of the details surrounding the central issue of the reading. If questions remain after reading this set of cards, additional Clavi clavi bleh, clarification cards are sometimes pulled from the pack and read as a part of the session. Most all tarot readings follow the same simple structure with little variation. 
The divinat divinatory system of Tarot at face value is quite simple. It's a deck of cards which, uh, with pictures placed in positions that have their own meanings. The card reader interprets the relationship of the card meanings to the positions. Anyone can learn how to do it. The new student of the system should, however, realize that their study of this subject can quickly deepen and broaden given the history of the cards and the symbology they contain. Given the potential breadth of the subject, experienced readers often urge beginners to choose the Rider weight deck to learn the basic meaning and symbology of the system before branching out to other interpretations of the tarot. There are literally hundreds of decks on the market, with new ones being developed and published almost daily. Although definitely confusing for the new student of the tarot, it is a collector's paradise for those who are interested in the historical origins and further development of this fascinating activity. The study of the symbology of the cards alone has caught the interest of many scholars who have written reams of the subject. A suggested list of books from beginner to authoritative commentary is listed at the end of this article. Harking back to the ancient sym symbology of the cards, another important influence on the understanding and interpretation of tarot was the work of Carl G. Jung and his study of archety archetypal uh, imagery, imagery arising from the human collective unconscious. In an introductory statement to Sally Nichols' book Jung, Jung and Tarot, Lawrence van der Post stated that he, Jung, recognized at once as he did in so many other games and primordial attempts at divination of the unseen and the future, that tarot had its origin and anticipation in profound patterns of the collective unconscious, which access to potential of increased awareness uniquely at the disposal of these patterns. Nichols herself states early on that it seems apparent that these old cards were conceived deep in the guts of human experience at the most profound level of the human psyche. It is to this level in ourselves that they will speak. Fortune telling? Many believe it is this view of the cards that explains the development of the cards from fortune telling. Uh, for, for fortune telling. Wade himself despised this aspect of the cards and took every opportunity to de denigrate this idea. Yet for this topic, Young's system of archetyp archetypal psychology suggests that we reevaluate our definition of the term fortune telling. Most people who hear the word instantly think of the rack-headed gypsy with a crystal ball and smoking and incense in the dark tent with a name pre preceded by Madame. However, modern uses for the cards has a elevated this image from the darkened tent into the light of developmental self-awareness plumbing the depth of psycho psychology and spiritual enlightenment. Today, fortune-telling with practiced readers can more often be a participa participatory session with an active and dynamic interplay between reader and querent, with the reader helping the questionnaire, uh, questioner divine their own sources of problems and solutions through the story presented in the images. Given today's rash of less than honest psychic pretenders, a good tarot reader is a rare find. Anyone can learn the tarot card meanings by mere road memorization. However, the skill of a good reader becomes obvious when they can tune in to that numinous interface between the energies of the cards and the spread 
and the energies of the querent and the issues that need to be discussed. You will notice the word need is used because inevitably the cards will most often speak to the issue of what the querent needs to know instead of or in addition to what the querent wants to know. In a good tarot session, the reader will develop a rapport with the querent and involve them in the reading rather than, rather than listening to a talking head. According to Mary Greer, a good reader will be able to pull all the cards in the spread together to interpret not only the message of each individual card, but the spread as a cohesive whole so that the querent can see the entire story. The best tarot readers today will often set up a dialogue about the cards in the reading, asking the readers ideas about what they see in the cards, which almost inevitably acts as a Rorschach test of sorts that helps the querent reveal issues that might have been deeply buried within their unconscious. Many who seek the services of a tarot reader or psychic are concerned with a surface problem that has manifested in their life but refuse to deal with the underlying issues that cause the problem. Often, tarot cards can reveal these issues and provide a forum where the querent can bring them out to discuss in an atmosphere of comfort and safety, much as in a professional counseling session. The good reader will also be able to recognize when a problem surfaces that is far beyond their scope of practice and suggest the querent seek additional counseling when the issue, issue warrants this step. If the querent does take the advice of the reader about seeking further counseling, they may just find themselves with a professional who uses the tarot as a basis for understanding their client's problems. In a foreword to Mary Greer's book Tarot Mirrors, tarot author Raquel Pollack comments that a growing number of people have realized that readings can serve as a primary means of penetrating into the layers of a personal person's life, a way of exposing desires and fears the conditioning of past experiences, the future developments that exist now in the immediate reality. Modern evolution. A growing number of professionals in the fields of science and psychology are using divinatory tools such as the tarot to help augment their attempts to define and explain what we here to for heretofore have considered the unknown and the supposedly unknowable. The symbols seem to make contact with something deep within which causes an opening up of areas of the unconscious which may have only been reachable in the dream state before. A good example is Dr. Art, Art Rosengarten. Art Rosengarten who presented a fascinating workshop at a 1996 symposium in Anaheim, California, entitled Using Tarot as a Mirror into Domestic Discord, in which he discussed the result of his political uh, pilot study on tarot reach into domestic violence. In this study, he was given permission to present a brief discussion of tarot to five court-ordered treatment groups for male offenders of domestic violence and seek volunteers to receive tarot readings which would be focused on issues related to their personal domestic and marital problems. Among the many fascinating results of the study was the universal ability of the test subjects to look at the cards and spreads and see their own stories, their own personal myths the images ena enabled them to reach within to see and identify with their personality characteristics pre present or missing within themselves, to identify and name their own reality. The cards helped them make sense of what they could not heretofore explain or put into words, 
to take the clothes of the emperor so they could see their situation as it really was. Author Cynthia Giles speaks on this subject quite well in her book The Tarot Methods, Mastery and More. And uh, when she says another important wellness aspect of Tarot is the reading process itself. The reading event offers an opportunity for profound connection between two people and there is substa substantial evidence that this person-to-person -person connection is vital for wellness as well as for healing. We can see in these examples that the tarot is not limited to the application of fortune-telling, but has gone beyond into the realm of being used as a healing tool, as a channel into the world of internal archetypal, archetypal images. It can be, and indeed is be, beginning to be used more and more as a bridge between mind and body to aid in healing the sicknesses of modern society. As in any field of study, one can choose to assimilate a cursory overview of the sub subject and then either abandon it for other paths or choose to delve deeper. In the field of tarot, Giles makes the statement that tarot brings with it its own invitations and its own initiations. Tarot can be pursued in many ways, at many levels, beyond a certain point. However, one either chooses to enter the path of mastery or determines to remain a dabbler. Entering the path sh surely does not mean you must devote your life to Tarot, but it does mean a change of attitude. On the path, Tarot becomes less an activity than a, a point of view. The Tarot's unique development from its origins as a simple parlor game to its evolution as a divinatory tool to its more modern development as a means for self-development and awareness provides a tempting, elaborate and many-faceted faceted subject that can engage the interests of historians, mystics and occultists alike. Suggested reading list. <laughs>